The United States move to withdraw from the Paris Agreement on Climate Change has sent shockwaves around the globe. The US President Donald Trump claims that he wants a fairer agreement that would not disadvantage American workers and by doing so, putting America first. The pact was signed by almost 200 countries with the aim of collectively addressing climate change by reducing greenhouse gas emissions. The Ministry of Environment and Tourism, Pohamba Shifeta, along with other world leaders, recently blasted the US President for withdrawing. Namibia is one of numerous other countries who have made environmental protection against climate change a key national development pillar. Environmental protection and conservation is one of the four key pillars for our fourth national development plan. We talk to a local environmentalist on what this means for developing countries and other range of issues. Good evening viewers and welcome to Unexclusive. My name is Joseph Shifeni. My guest this evening is Dr. Chris Brown, CEO of the Namibian Chamber of Environment. Doctor, welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Joseph. Donald Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Agreement on Climate Change. What does that mean for developing countries such as Namibia that are trying to strengthen efforts in reducing climate change? Well, I think it has a number of impacts. Firstly, at the level of global leadership, America was working closely with the uh, EU and other countries to bring in some of the big polluting countries in the developing world, such as China and India. And uh, they worked very hard to make sure that those countries came in and so that we would have a, a global impact and we wouldn't have some of the big uh, carbon dioxide producers continuing pr to produce in the face of the rest of the world. And I think that commitment by the Obama administration, together with the European Union, had been a very successful uh, team effort to uh, really forge a global approach to uh, climate change and mitigating the impacts of climate change. The second component is the Green Climate Fund. Now, the Green Climate Fund was set up specifically to help developing countries and, and countries in transition to do two things. To, on the one hand, find a de development pathway for themselves that didn't go down the same polluter path that the developed countries had gone down, countries such as America, um, and to find new ways of developing without that very heavy um, fossil fuel base type of dependence. And the second component was to create a fund to help countries that are bearing the brunt of the impacts of climate change. So many parts of the world are, are getting drier. That has a huge impact on the production and uh, welfare and well-being of those countries. Other parts of the country of the world are getting wetter, floods, and places like Bangladesh come to mind. And in Namibia, we have a little bit of both. Uh, the effects in the, in, the, in the top reaches of our northern rivers is to increase rainfall, and in the rest of the country is to reduce rainfall. So Namibia is in a situation where we, have <clears throat> we, we, where we have probably more floods coming in the future and where we have the country drying off. So the Green Climate Fund was specifically there to help countries find ways to adapt to climate change as well as to find countries, uh, to help countries find ways to mitigate uh, the effect of climate change in their development process to shortcut those long development pathways that are very heavy on, on fossil fuels and high, high production of uh, CO2s, carbon dioxides. So with, with the withdrawal of America from uh, the Paris Agreement, uh, we've heard from Donald Trump that he is also going to be curtailing or stopping altogether, it's not quite clear yet, uh, their commitments to the Green Climate Fund. And for, for us in developing countries and as global citizens, this is very unfortunate because on the one hand, per capita, America is the biggest polluter, the biggest CO2 producer on the planet. Uh, and on the other hand, they expect the rest of the world to absorb the problems which they have created and others like them, and we, particularly the poor countries of the world, and in particularly the poorest people of the world, have to carry the burden of that climate change. And they're going to continue. By all accounts, uh, America is now bringing coal back into production. They're going to be opening up new oil fields. So they seem to be going along a high uh, fossil fuel development pathway. They're not helping the rest of the world. And uh, it looks as if um, 
their America First policy is America First at the expense of the rest of the world. Uh, as you mentioned now, uh, uh, America is, uh, if not the uh, biggest polluter currently. How will this move affect the legitimacy of the agreement? Well, that's interesting. Um, no, the rest of the world, when they saw this U-turn which uh, America has taken under Donald Trump, and before we answer that, maybe I should just step back a minute and say, you know, not the whole of America is going down this pathway. The Oval Office is leading this type of approach. But many of the cities, 180, over 180 cities, more than 10 governors in America are saying we're going to continue to meet our obligations under the climate change agreement, under the Paris Accord, from our cities and our, and, and our regions in, in America, we're going to continue to support that. So it's not the whole of America and it's not a unif universal American position. It's very much uh, a position of this president through this component of America's history. And um, so the impacts would not be as great as if the whole of America and all the components, cities and, 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 and regions, states of America were pulling out. But it is a blow. But the effect it has had has been almost to galvanize the rest of the world to say, listen, America's pulling out, but we're not going to. China, India, uh, the European Union, many of the other countries, most of the other countries are going to be continuing with the work and renewing their efforts. And I think the world will now look for a new global leader. Our global leader on these issues doesn't always have to be America. There are very, very many other countries out there that have perhaps a more long-term committed sort of moral outlook on global issues. Um, and uh, I think this is an opportunity for a new global leader to emerge. Maybe it's time for a country like China to stand up and say, listen, we're going to take the lead here. We're going to demonstrate our own approach, and we're going to be a global leader, and we're going to step forward. So I think we're looking at interesting times ahead. Now, are these countries, uh, such as China that you just mentioned, are they up to the challenge? Because we've also seen other countries, such as France, um, um, coming mm -hmm. up and, and saying that uh, they want to fill the void. Are they up to the yeah. challenge? Well, I think the more countries that come forward and try and fill the void, the better. Obviously, China has a lot of um, uh, pollution troubles of their own, but China is a country that can address things when they set their mind to doing something. They can address things very, very efficiently and effectively. They mobilize the whole country behind. Maybe it'll, it won't be China. Maybe it'll be the European Union. Maybe it'll be a country in the European Union. Maybe it'll be Canada. But generally, um, the rest of the world is saying, we're not going to stop. We recognize that the world is in a very, very fragile, dicey stage in terms of um, global warming. We're not going to stop. We're going to push ahead. And uh, if America wants to stay out for a few years while Donald Trump is there, so be it. But the rest of the world is going ahead. And I think that gives countries like Namibia and other developing countries that bear the brunt of this um, a lot of confidence because we should continue to do our part uh, as well as we can. We should ensure that our emissions don't get out of hand. We keep our emissions really low. Namibia is a net sump. We absorb more carbon dioxide than we produce. But at the moment, we are starting to lose our forests. Our, our, our woodlands up in the north are being degraded. We, 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 we are seeing deforestation taking place. One of the things where Namibia really needs to put effort now is into maintaining and protecting our vegetation cover off, particularly our woodlands up in the northeast of the country. And, uh, and so if we continue with our commitment, we look at how we can deal with our country in the years ahead. There will be green climate funding. It won't be as big as, as we'd hoped it would be because of America's pulling out. But uh, you know, I think, that, I think the world will be in a better place if we all pull together. Mr. Trump made this decision uh, because he's one of those that believe that uh, human activity is not entirely responsible for climate change. What else is there? No, I mean, climate change is something that happens uh, irrespective of humans being on this planet. Uh, and it has always happened, and the world's got hotter and then cooler and then hotter and cooler, and we've had ice ages and 
glacier formation and so on. Deserts have come and go, and uh, tropical forests have expanded and shrunk, and that's part of nature. But what's happening now is that the world is getting hotter faster than it's ever got before. And it pushes the world beyond thresholds which we've seen before. And that has a huge effect on life on Earth, but also on humans. Our production systems will be flooded, will be overheated, diseases will move and spread, um, areas will dry out. And you know, the, the, the issue of climate change is not just temperature and rainfall. Um, they're, they're linked, but it's also um, soil cover, uh, the n amount of CO2 in the air affecting the production of different types of plants, bush encroachment and so on, is linked to high levels of CO2. Um, it's also linked to soil moisture, humidity in the air, how the rain falls, whether it falls in a few big thunderstorms and runs off, or if it's nice gentle rain. All of these things are linked, and they all have a compounding effect. So uh, a little bit of temperature increase, a little bit of rainfall uh, decline has a much accelerated and a much expanded effect on soil moisture, for example, which is the basis of our production system. So the, the, the cumulative effect of the impacts of climate change are far greater than just the temperature measurement and the rainfall. It's all those other factors, humidity in the air, soil moisture, cover of the earth cover and so on, which all have a compounding effect. So it's something which um, is, is very serious for us. In Namibia, we've done some work on the impacts of climate change on the country. And this is something that hasn't been done many, in many other places in the world. Most other places have talked in very general terms about what's happening. Here we've looked to see where our rainfall isohytes are going to be in, by 2050 and by 2080. And the, the, the really concerning uh, results we've got is that at the moment the boundary between large stock farming and small stock farming, where large stock farming is no longer really uh, economically viable when you go below a certain rainfall, is just south of Vintuk. Now that line, that rainfall line of about 280, 300 millimetres, that rainfall line will move north and east. And by 2050 we will have lost about 18 million hectares of land that was good cattle land. It will no longer be viable, the rainfall will be too low, it will no longer be economically viable. By, 20, by 2075, 80, we'll have lost another 9 million hectares of land beyond that. So it will push the production of cattle right up pretty much to the southern boundary of Itosha. So everything south of that will not be good cattle producing area. You can do the same thing for Mohongu production for pearl millet. At the moment, you can grow mohongu down to about 400, 380 millimetres in, 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 in reasonable years. By 2050, the whole of the central, north central area, the former of Omberland, will no longer be viable mohongu producing areas. So what are people going to do? These are the questions we need to get our minds around. What land use are we looking at in the years ahead? Because the conditions which allow us to have cattle, in sort of north of Vintuk, and the conditions which allow us to grow mahongu up in the north, those conditions will have changed, and it'll be too dry to do that. And so it really, as, prog as a progressive country, our well, progressive politicians need to be doing, looking ahead 20, 30 years to say, let's start getting ourselves geared to this situation. Proper long-term planning, what we're going to do, how we're going to... Uh, change the economies of these areas to keep them productive but at that lower rainfall area, uh, under those lower rainfall conditions. What other land use options do we have? How can we promote an economy that can work without cattle in those areas, without mahongu production in those areas and so on? So let's move on to marine related matters. The Ministry of Fisheries has denied a moratorium that you um, call for to save the uh, sardine species. How long do we have left until the species is gone from our waters? You know, we're right on the edge. We are right on the brink. Pilchards and sardines, um, sardines are just small pilchards and pilchards are bigger sardines. Uh, they're members of the herring family. Right. They are a really important part of our marine ecosystem. Just about all our commercial species 
of fish other than pilchards, the other commercial species, feed on pilchards. Um, and the rest, much of the rest of the marine ecosystem is dependent on pilchards. And what's happened since the 1960s, and uh, a lot of this happened before Namibia's independence, but what happened in the 1960s is that there was a huge amount of pressure and fishing illegally and so on, foreign vessels coming in, some of it local, came in, and the fish pilchard stock at that stage, they were catching over a million tons of pilchards a year. So the stock out there was probably in the order of five, six, seven, eight million tons. The, the stock collapsed on, on excess fishing, and then shortly after independence, it was protected and it built up a little bit, and then it collapsed again. Today, if last year, they caught less than 4,000 tons of pilchards, compared to the over a million tons in the 60s. And the fisheries biologists estimate that our pilchard stock has been, has, we're down to less than 1% of what used to be there. We've lost 99% of our pilchard stock. The effect of that on some of the uh, marine, uh, wi uh, marine wildlife is very clear. Um, our African penguin, their population has declined by 50% because they feed on largely on pilchards. Um, the Cape Gannet, has declined by more than 85%, just in the last three generations, not since the 1960s, just in the last 15 years or so. Um, the bank cormorant, uh, an endemic to southern Africa, like the, the penguin and the gannet, uh, they only occur in southern African waters, uh, their population has dropped by 50%, more than 50%. And it's all down to the food base, the, the pilchard sardine situation. There are a few other things which contribute, but by far the biggest contribution is the food base. So, <clears throat> we've got an ecological disaster, but we've also got an economic disaster, because if we allowed those, pilch those pilchards to build up, we could have a vibrant pilchard industry. We could be, we could be catching about a quarter of a million tons of pilchards a year. At the moment, we, don't, we battle to catch three or 4,000 tons. We could be catching a quarter of a million tons a year. And that would create income for the country, it would create lots of jobs, and it would also provide a very, very healthy food supply for the country. A quarter of a million, how long will it take for these species to recuperate to that level? Well, we don't really know, but we think that there should be a moratorium placed on, on um, pilchard fishing for at least the next three to five years. And in parallel with that, a very close monitoring system, uh, stock surveys taking place. And that those stock surveys should dictate when fishing should be opened again. So let their, let's use the science. At the moment, uh, the minister is saying, well, he's guessing, he doesn't really know. He thinks they might have gone out to sea. Uh, I mean, I. I the, you may as well say, I think they might have gone onto the land or they might be hiding up a river <laughs> somewhere. I mean, that's just silly. Namibia uh, uh, adopts a precautionary principle. When we see month after month, year after year after year, no decent rebuilding of that stock, we continue to give quotas, um, then we're just asking for trouble. We are not supporting the sustainable policies that are in our constitution. And the minister should be out there in front right at the forefront saying, I as the minister am responsible for this marine ecosystem. I'm going to close down the pilchard sector until my scientists have told me that the stocks are healthy enough to be taking, uh, setting a, a, a quota, maybe starting with a small quota and building it up as things go. But to say, I'm not listening to my scientists, I'm just gonna take a guess, I think they might have gone out to sea, so I'm gonna issue a quota, that is irresponsible. What about the seals? They probably consume more uh, uh, pilchards than uh, those caught by fishermen. No, so it, uh, there's been a lot of work done on the seal um, diets. Um, and the, 
the cause of the collapse of the pilchard industry and the pilchard stock was overfishing. These huge nets, more and more boats with bigger and bigger boats, bigger and bigger nets, out for longer and longer, factories out at sea. It's, uh, it's the big, it's, it's the fishing industry that has caused the collapse of the pilchard stock. And you're seeing the effect now on the seabirds and other, and other commercial fisheries, hake and so on, is also suffering because they also feed on, um, on pilchards. So this is a really important component of our marine ecosystem, which must be protected, and it's also a very important part of our economy, which could be built up. Um, now, whether we can ever get those pilchards back again, um, we're right on the very edge. We push us any longer, and we will have essentially lost our pilchards from the system. We need to take urgent action. We need to follow the directives of our constitution. We need to make sure that we're using these resources sustainably, both for a balanced ecosystem and also for people, the economy, jobs, uh, and good quality food. Just briefly, give us a scenario where there are no pilchards. All right, all right. Well, if, if the pilchards disappear from our system altogether, we will see all sorts of declines. Our seabirds will continue to decline. Um, the species which feed on them, our dolphins and porpoises and all the food layers in between will, will decline. Um, our production system, our, our fisheries will be so much poorer for it. Our commercial, many of our commercial fish, uh, they, they will decline because they don't have the pilchards to feed on. Um, and the, the coastal economy, where we could be creating lots of jobs with fish factories and so on, will be suffering. And, and the, the, the access of, by Namibians to a really healthy, um, cheap s source of food uh, will be denied. So this is a really important issue, and uh, I would really like to see it be taken up in Cabinet again, and uh, not just let one minister make such a fundamental decision on behalf of the nation, these are our fish, and uh, for science to play a far more important role uh, and not let the industry dominate in terms of decision making, which seems to be the case now, let science and sustainability dominate in the interests of all of those areas that I've spoken about in the long term. Last question, uh, throughout recent weeks, uh, we've been seeing incidents of human wildlife conflict in the northern part of the country, yes. where lions are shot and killed for killing livestock. Yeah. Where does the problem lie and what is the best approach in this regard? Well, that, that's, that's a difficult uh, question. The, the, the problem is this, lions are very fertile breeders. Um, they produce quite a big litter of cubs, quite a few of those survive. And so Itosha is producing more lions than are dying, and so the surplus lions are moving out of Itosha. Uh, the moment they move out, they come into conflict with somebody. And uh, what happens in some areas is that farmers take matters into their own hands, and they shoot the lions when they come out, uh, or they bring in trophy hunters to shoot the lions. Uh, but the ministry d uh, maintains that uh, the fence of Etosha is in a dilapidated state. Yes, so, but even if you have the smartest fence, it's very difficult to keep lions in. So you have a smart fence, a warthog goes underneath, a lion can crawl underneath. So it's, it, to keep lions in, even if you have a good fence, is a very difficult thing to do. And when you have surplus animals, the young animals, they compete with the old animals, the old animals are still dominant, the young animals get chased out, they have to go somewhere. Itosha is full of lions, there's no place for them to go, so they leave the park. So it's bound to happen? It's bound to happen, unless, unless you deal with them in the park, for example, unless you do trophy hunting in the park, or unless you, um, uh, unless you put your lions on, on pregnancy pills, which was an experiment that was done in Namibia many years ago, where they implanted uh, the pill into li female lions uh, and stop them reproducing, uh, that works. 
but it has perhaps other impacts, and it's a difficult thing, and it's a timely thing to manage. That was done under a research project, um, but to do it as a management, uh, as a management tool, is maybe more difficult. You know, north of Itosha, when the lions move out, um, the people turn to the government to say, and the Ministry of Environment to say, the lions are here, come and help me, and they don't get out in time. And it's very difficult for them to get out in time before the lions catch something or kill something. Um, one, one of the ways to deal with it is simply to say those lions at Levi Tosha are expendable. We don't want to start, we don't want to protect them, we don't need to protect them. They um, should be killed? Maybe we, we, we shoot them. Maybe we get trophy hunters in and uh, we make money from them. That's one way of looking at it. Um, there, are, there is a good case to be made to create a link between Itosha lions and the lions in the Skeleton Coast Park and, and in parts of Cuneni. As soon as populations become isolated, they're less resilient. So there could be different approaches taken in those areas where some form of uh, helping farmers protect their stock with, um, with, metal, with metal kraals for, the, for them to put the animals in at night, um, for them to have radios on the animals so they can get early warning that the lions are coming into the area, look after their cattle, there could be a case made for, in some areas, for more intensive management for lions. But generally, around the whole of Itosha, um, those lions are, are more than Namibia has can, and can deal with. You know, the park's full of lions, they breed more lions, they go out. Well, where do you put them? There is nowhere to put them. So uh, as long as our other parks have got lions, we've got to make sure we've got lions in the, in, in the Bobwata area in that national park, We've got lions in the cowdom. If all those parks are full, then we've got extra lions. And uh, um, we need to find a way to deal with them. And maybe the best way is simply to hunt them. Dr. Lemmy, thank you for joining me. One exclusive. And that is all we have for tonight. Be sure to share your views on the topic with us on our social media pages or by texting them to the number 555 SMS cost $1 million. Until next time, I'm Joseph Shifeni for One Exclusive. Thanks for watching.